MEIC presents Down to Earth, the audio mag. I'm Katie Spence, and this is the December 2023 issue. From a board member. Written by Jesse Wiles. Read by Katie Spence. What leads some people to give up and accept the state of the world while others take action? For many of us, learning the impacts and existential threat of climate change has led to increased feelings of grief, sadness, anxiety, and fear for the future, often branded informally as climate anxiety. Climate anxiety, though a shared intergenerational experience, may be felt even more deeply by the younger generation and those in marginalized communities, who often feel the weighty burden of fixing our current climate crisis. As the study of the link between climate and mental health continues to expand, we are learning more about the nuances of climate-related emotions, which include not only climate anxiety, but also climate worry, ecological grief, and solastalgia, a term used to describe pain and distress experienced by those witnessing their home environments destroyed or changed in unwelcome ways. In short, our feelings around the climate crisis can be complex and nuanced. And, importantly, these intense feelings are a healthy response to the state of our world. All too often, these overwhelming feelings can lead us to give up hope and feel there is nothing we can do to make a difference, because our planet is already too far gone, the obstacles are too big, and our voice is too small. Yet, these feelings can sometimes bring on a deep sense of urgency to take actions to address climate change. Which brings me to my original question. Why do some people take action to address our climate crisis? while others don't act, even when feeling the same levels of climate distress. Climate emotions research indicates that people are more likely to act when they feel they have a sense of agency. Agency is feeling like we can make an actual difference in addressing climate change in some capacity. I offer this simple message to those fellow humans out there with feelings of climate worry and climate anxiety. MEIC can be your vehicle for agency in the climate crisis. Not everyone has the time or the means to be climate activists, or take individual climate-related actions. But by simply being a supporter of MEIC, you are taking action. You have an outsized impact on how Montana addresses climate change. You have influence in court battles seeking to uphold our constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. And you have a voice in the legislature to affect state policy. That's agency. And that's how our collective action becomes your action. So I say this, spread the word. Lend a listening ear to friends and family struggling with complex climate emotions. Share yours. Acknowledge the importance of these emotions. And, with compassion, offer your people the gift of agency when it comes to addressing climate change. They can, in fact, make a difference. Let them know that MEIC staff shows up, with urgency, every day, to carry our voices out into the world on so many stages. By supporting MEIC with a membership, or by learning about MEIC's work and sharing it with your friends, or by taking an action from an email, you are making the choice to have an enormous impact in addressing the climate crisis. You have agency. Of course, feeling agency won't cure our climate anxiety, but a sense of agency can mean the difference between giving up hope and living meaningfully in the face of climate change. Let us each choose meaning, and importantly, share this gift with others. For the last 10 years, Jesse Wiles has been working in areas of public land law and Indian law for the DOI Solicitor's Office, for Montana DNRC, and now in private practice. As a mom, Jesse is passionate about giving our kids the chance to thrive in a clean and healthful environment and supporting Montana families as we address the challenges and inequities brought on by climate change. PSC approves Northwestern's 28% electricity rate hike for residents. Written by Ann Hedges, read by Katie Spence. Anyone who watched the most recent Northwestern Energy rate case meetings was left wondering whether the Public Service Commissioners, PSC, had read any of the thousands of pages of documents and expert reports that detailed why Northwestern was not entitled to its proposed electric rate increase. It was clear the commissioners hadn't listened to testimony or comments about the rapidly rising cost of living and the concern for those who are already facing steep housing and food costs. Instead, the PSC did what Northwestern asked and saddled hundreds of thousands of Montanans and families with the largest share of the increase in electricity rates. In normal rate case proceedings, 
elected PSC commissioners will discuss the merits of the arguments raised by the parties who participated in the case. The commissioners will debate whether to increase rates as requested by a monopoly utility or whether to choose a different path that better protects customers, but not this time. Instead of publicly discussing the positions of the various parties and providing direction to the staff to craft a draft order, the PSC took a new, very troubling path. It made a decision behind closed doors, away from the eyes of the public whom it serves. It never publicly debated the merits of the case. It never publicly provided direction to the staff to craft a proposed order. It never told the public why it couldn't protect their interests from a monopoly utility that is required to benefit its shareholders, regardless of the impact on captive customers. In short, the commission never told the public why it disagreed with the vast majority of parties in the rate case, and instead allowed Northwestern to increase residential electric bills a whopping 28%. Residential customers are left wondering why they have to shoulder a greater increase in their electric rates than business and major industrial customers. One reason might be that Northwestern struck a deal with the Montana Consumer Council, MCC, and large industrial customers. Like MEIC, the MCC had strongly objected to some very unusual riders in the original rate request, which would have increased customer costs even more by allowing the utility to charge hundreds of millions of dollars for Northwestern's Laurel gas plant. Northwestern agreed to eliminate these riders in order to persuade the MCC to strike a deal. The MCC, who represents all customers and not just residences, was under the gun. Its budget was still before the legislature, and it had been publicly targeted by Republican leaders early in the session, narrowly escaping an outright attempt to muzzle it in legislative committees. Days before the April PSC rate hearing, the MCC struck a deal with Northwestern and some of the largest industrial facilities in the state that would require residential customers to bear the brunt of the rate increase. At the October hearing, the PSC commissioners complained that they didn't have the authority to reject the deal and that protecting customers was the sole responsibility of the MCC. Commissioners read prepared statements and didn't consider the arguments of other parties who were excluded from the deal. In actuality, the PSC is elected to protect all customers, including residential customers, and balance the interests of average Montanans with the right of the utility to earn fair compensation for the service it provides. What is the point of having a PSC if the monopoly utility always gets whatever it wants, without regard to the harm suffered by Montanans? The fact that Montanans now have the highest electricity rates in the region means the PSC is failing to do its job. Montana families are the losers in this dangerous new approach to utility, quote-unquote, oversight. Keeping an Eye on Hydrogen Hubs Written by Nick Fitzmorris Read by Katie Spence In October, the Biden administration announced $7 billion in awards to develop seven distinct, quote-unquote, clean hydrogen hubs across the U.S., These funds are part of the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. The regional hubs are the Mid-Atlantic, Appalachian, California, Gulf Coast, Heartland, Midwest, and Pacific Northwest. Last year, Governor Greg Gianforte entered an agreement with the governors of North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin to be part of the Heartland Hub. But when the grants were announced, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota were the only states included though press releases state the hub may later expand into neighboring states, such as eastern Montana. However, some of these federal funds are still likely to reach Montana through the Pacific Northwest Hub, tentatively including a project for western Montana's St. Regis. Producing hydrogen from water using electrolysis is an incredibly energy-intensive process, while clean hydrogen, or hydrogen produced using only clean energy, is likely to be a part of the energy transition It should only be used for the most challenging decarbonization sectors. These hard-to-abate sectors include industrial and commercial applications, such as cement production, shipping, and aviation. While these industries may need to rely on clean hydrogen to decarbonize fuelly, they should do so only after alternatives are thoroughly considered. This use of hydrogen must truly be clean, with zero associated emissions throughout the fuel's value chain. Although touted as clean, Not all of the hubs are truly slated to be so. Hydrogen is classified by a range of colors based on how it is produced. Included in these hydrogen hubs are blue, pink, and green hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels, where CO2 is captured and either stored or repurposed. 
and pink hydrogen is produced using nuclear power. These forms of hydrogen rely on expensive and unproven technologies. Green hydrogen is produced using 100% renewable energy for the electrolysis of water and is the only true clean form of hydrogen production. Four of these hubs plan to use blue hydrogen in part, including the Heartland Hub. The Pacific Northwest Hub intends to use green hydrogen from hydropower and other renewable energy sources. Unfortunately, very little information has been released by the U.S. Department of Energy regarding these proposals, and there are no publicly available plans for scaling up renewable energy generation to power these hubs. It is important to keep an eye on these hydrogen hubs as they develop to ensure extensive federal funds are not wasted or put toward polluting hydrogen projects. Will the state listen to the public on MEPA and the climate? Written by Ann Hedges, read by Katie Spence. Time and time again, when attempts arise to weaken the Montana Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA, Montanans show up to ask the state to comply with its constitutional obligation, quote, to maintain and improve a clean and healthful environment in Montana for present and future generations, end quote. More than 300 people turned out for purported listening sessions held by the Montana Department of Environment Equality, DEQ, in October regarding how to streamline MEPA and what to do about a court-ordered climate analysis. While MEPA implements Montanans' constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment, the legislature and DEQ pretend that a stable climate is not part of the, quote, environmental life support system, end quote, that is protected in the Constitution. Fortunately for us, hundreds of people at the hearings in Billings, Helena, and Missoula politely disagreed and insisted that the state do its job. Contrary to the state's prior and ongoing approach, two district courts recently said that the state must consider climate impacts when conducting environmental reviews under MEPA. In May, a Billings district court agreed with MEIC, Earth Justice, and Sierra Club when it required the state to consider the climate impacts of Northwestern Energy's Laurel gas plant. DEQ has yet to conduct the required analysis six months later. In August, a Helena District Court in Held v. State of Montana said the Constitution requires the state to consider climate impacts of proposed projects under MEPA. DEQ continues to issue fossil fuel permits that fail to consider climate change. Despite telling the court under oath that it could analyze climate impacts in MEPA decisions, DEQ continues to feign confusion about its legal obligation. These public listening sessions and year-long stakeholder group process are just more stall tactics. The stakeholder group, sure to be rigged in favor of the fossil fuel industry, is purportedly intended to uncover how MEPA can be, quote-unquote, fixed. However, DEQ has no authority to do such a thing. State agencies are required to follow the law as written by the legislature or interpreted by the courts. Only the legislature can change a law such as MEPA, which it did earlier this year. The 2023 legislature ignored thousands of public comments arguing against weakening MEPA, passing two laws that were found to be unconstitutional in the held case only a few months later. Now, the state is attempting to avoid compliance with the court for at least another year, while the planet experiences record heat, drought, storms, floods, and widespread death. The tools to analyze climate impacts in Montana exist. The federal government has spent years perfecting a widely used metric called the social cost of greenhouse gases, which puts a monetary figure on each ton of greenhouse gas that goes into the atmosphere. Check the show notes for a link to the, a chart for more information. DEQ could easily do the same analysis for proposed projects. Only a handful of industry lobbyists attended the MEPA listening sessions the claim MEPA needs to be fixed. Everyone else earnestly asked DEQ to finally do its job and consider climate impacts in state projects. Quote, as a young person who loves Montana, loves being outdoors, who wants to raise a family and wants to live here, I urge you to listen to the voices of my peers, and even more importantly, those who are younger than me. I urge you to see them and hear them. End quote. Said Isabel Shada from Bozeman. Tom Caffrey, a Helena High School teacher, wisely said, quote, there is not a right way to do the wrong thing, end quote. John Heron, a former DEQ employee who spent years writing environmental impact statements for coal mines, said, quote, 
We are facing the worst nightmare you can put into a movie, end quote. Many other voices joined them. High school students showed up to beg for a livable future. Elderly folks spoke on behalf of their grandchildren. Ranchers spoke about climate impacts on agriculture, as well as doctors, lawyers, college professors. The list goes on. That only leaves one remaining question for DEQ. Will it protect our constitutional rights, or will it continue to stall while the planet burns? What's the deal with the social cost of greenhouse gases? Written by Nick Fitzmorris, read by Katie Spence. The social cost of greenhouse gases is a metric that estimates the economic damage caused by each additional ton of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases emitted into Earth's atmosphere. This metric allows decision makers to internalize the cost of greenhouse gas emissions that were previously externalized. The federal government has calculated this cost since 2009, currently estimated at $51 per ton emitted. But the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency proposed increasing the value to $190 in November 2022. The Montana Department of Environmental Quality could use this metric in its analyses under the Montana Environmental Policy Act, MEPA, to assess the impact of projects forecasted greenhouse gas emissions or to demonstrate the social cost of burden through projects that eliminate or prevent greenhouse gas emissions. Fourteen states already use this social cost to assess greenhouse gas emission impacts, including Colorado, Nevada, and Washington. Additionally, the social cost metric has been federally recommended for use in National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, environmental reviews, as well as in federal agency budgeting, procurement, and other decision-making. The U.S. Department of Transportation and the U.S. Postal Service are already utilizing the metric. DEQ could be doing the same. Montana's Terrible Plan to Grease the Skids for a Massive Wyoming Coal Mine Written by Durf Johnson, read by Katie Spence Astronomical profits are motivating coal corporations to increase their export capacity in order to take advantage of a lucrative Asian market. The Powder River Basin in southeastern Montana and northern Wyoming, the largest source of coal burned for electricity in the United States, is no exception. Montana mines in this region include the Bull Mountain Mine and the Spring Creek Mine, which currently export a large volume of their coal to international markets, primarily through Canadian ports. Now, the Navajo Transitional Energy Company, Intec, is looking to further capitalize on a large and profitable export market by building out a new Wyoming mine. And the Montana Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, is willing to pave the way, our climate be damned. Currently, coal mining corporations are making profits hand over fist on the international market and are looking at every avenue possible to increase sales and double down on revenue. Much of this is due to a growing demand for coal in Asia, and in particular, China. According to the Energy Information Administration, a coal exporter in 2022 could expect upwards of $115 per ton for exports to Asian markets, whereas domestic sales were approximately $34 per ton a 240% difference in price. Following the bankruptcy of Cloud Peak Energy in 2019, Intec acquired a number of Cloud Peak assets, including the Spring Creek coal mine in Montana, as well as the Antelope and Correro Rojo mines in Wyoming. Intec also acquired the Young's Creek mine, a proposed and fully permitted Wyoming coal mine right on the Montana border that has not yet broken ground. Mining tens of millions of coal tonnage annually at Young's Creek has been a dream of the coal industry since the late 1970s, but the limiting factor in its viability appears to primarily be that the transportation component of exporting the coal has proven difficult. Now that Intech is on the scene and massive profits are on the horizon, there is a renewed interest in developing Young's Creek, and the Montana DEQ is complicit in the plan. Rather than build out existing rail infrastructure to Young's Creek, which comes at high capital costs, Intech is now on the path to building out a coal haul road, which will allow for massive 240-ton trucks to haul coal on nine miles of road in Montana from Young's Creek to Spring Creek, where Intech could take advantage of existing railroad infrastructure to export the coal. To be clear, these massive trucks will make approximately 130 trips every day, seven days per week, 365 days per year. 
in addition to facilitating a carbon bomb and adding more coal to Montana's coal-choked roadways, the road would cut directly through prime sage-grouse habitat and destroy several lek sites in the process. Intec's predecessor, Cloud Peak, originally applied to the Montana DEQ for a permit to build the Hall Road in December 2015. In summer 2018, DEQ issued a Draft Environmental Impact Statement, EIS, which was intended to evaluate the myriad environmental issues associated with the construction of the Hall Road. However, noticeably absent was any evaluation of the carbon emissions that would result from Montana facilitating and enabling a new coal mine in Wyoming. MEIC submitted comments in 2018 on the draft EIS, urging the agency to account for or consider carbon emissions in its evaluation. Those requests were ignored, but the application then went dormant. After the application sat for five long years, DEQ suddenly deemed the Hall Road application acceptable on August 11th and issued a final EIS. The acceptability determination is one of the final steps for approval of a coal mine permit and includes a short comment period for the public. Most importantly, the final EIS specifically refused to analyze climate impacts, citing the laws passed just month prior during the 2023 Montana legislature, which specifically prohibited DEQ from considering climate impacts in its environmental analyses. DEQ's timing is impeccable. Just four days after the acceptability determination and final EIS were issued, a groundbreaking case held v. State of Montana was released where a district court judge ruled that the state of Montana has a duty to consider climate impacts when conducting an EIS process. The judge further ruled that the law passed in 2023 that prohibited the state from considering climate change was unconstitutional and could not be enforced. MEIC subsequently submitted comments on DEQ's acceptability determination and final EIS, noting that the laws were now invalid, that DEQ had a responsibility and an obligation to analyze climate impacts and that it was still required to do so through a supplemental EIS, as the agency had not reached a final decision. Rather than conduct what is legally required, DEQ shirked off our concerns and issued a final approval of the Hall Road to Intec on September 26. The approval of the Hall Road was Intec's last hurdle to mine up to 291 million tons of recoverable coal from Young's Creek, haul it by truck to Spring Creek, and export it to power plants across the world, where it will be fed into boilers that destroy our climate. 291 million tons of coal is massive, representing more than half of all the coal burned in the United States in 2022 for electricity. That was 513 million tons. The thought that the Montana Department of Environmental Quality is not just complicit in this plan, but is refusing to analyze climate change impacts in the year 2023 even after a judge has ordered it to do so, is shocking and appalling. Watch this space, as there's a good chance we're going to hold the DEQ to account for this injustice. The federal government recommends reform of outdated mining laws. Written by Durf Johnson, read by Katie Spence. Our hard rock mining laws are broken and outdated. In particular, the laws governing extraction on federal public lands. Over the coming decades, this problem will be especially acute as the mining industry pushes to extract more metals at a lower cost, in part to feed our needed transition to a clean, carbon-free energy system. In fact, many corporations have pivoted their messaging to the, quote, necessity of mining in order to produce the, quote, critical minerals necessary for windmills, solar panels, and batteries. While no one can argue that clean energy facilities need metals, The mining industry arguments give short shrift to the parallel necessity of protecting clean water, clean air, and public health during the climate crisis, when these essential ingredients for life and prosperity become all the more critical. Recognizing the inevitable changes that our nation and the world now face, President Joe Biden directed the U.S. Department of Interior to conduct a comprehensive review of our nation's mining laws and regulations. Over the past several months, the Interagency Working Group convened experts, stakeholders, and the public to review our outdated laws and make recommendations for reform. The extensive set of recommendations was released in a report in September and includes both regulatory and policy changes that agencies, such as the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, etc., could enact almost immediately, as well as more sweeping reforms that will require congressional approval. Most notably, the report recommends that Congress scrap the 1872 mining law. 
the antiquated law that governs mineral extraction on federal public lands and convert to a leasing system with royalty payments to the public the eighteen seventy two mining law was passed during the presidency of ulysses s grant aimed at settling the west and regulating miners with pickaxes and mules it has long since proven to be inadequate in protecting the environment and people from modern mining unfortunately its one hundred fifty one year duration implicitly signals the difficulty in reforming this law and the likelihood of congress passing legislation for president biden to sign is slim to nil however the report also provides an extensive set of recommendations for federal agencies to implement that do not require congressional approval such as increasing public and tribal engagement making permitting processes more consistent and predictable protecting impacted communities and workers and safeguarding environmentally and culturally sensitive lands time will ultimately tell whether and how federal agencies will implement such reforms but the report offers a relatively straightforward set of goals that agencies can and should work to implement over the next few years water pollution knows no borders how canadian coal is poisoning montana waters written and read by katie spence lake kukanusa continues to be plagued by selenium pollution from canadian coal mining and meic continues to hold the line alongside a number of partners we've shared updates about kukanusa and previous issues of down to earth but meic's part in this campaign is just one piece of a much larger story to tell it more fully we have to start at the source of the pollution in british columbia's bc's elk valley the selenium problem wide wild rivers meander through dramatic mountains and support a robust ecosystem full of critters such as grizzlies wolves and wolverines in the elk valley unfortunately 120 years of coal mining is taking its toll on the valley its rivers and its inhabitants tech coal operates four active mountaintop removal metallurgical coal mines that leach toxic amounts of selenium into the elk and upper fording rivers rendering a popular fishing destination incapable of supporting healthy fish populations the health impacts of selenium are not insignificant the u.s forest service reports that once selenium is in water it can bioaccumulate in food chains and become toxic to aquatic life selenium impacts on fish can range from subtle effects on growth to severe deformities and complete reproductive failure tech has been ordered to pay several large fines for water pollution and resulting fish kills including the largest fine imposed under canada's fisheries act 60 million dollars ordered in 2021 one tributary of the elk river the upper fording river experienced a devastating 93 percent decrease in adult west slope cutthroat trout populations during fall 2019 compared to 2017 levels in addition several towns on the elk river have also experienced issues with selenium polluting groundwater wells costing them millions of dollars because selenium is incredibly difficult to remove from water and rivers pay no heeds to borders and complex international water pollution policy the issue gets more complicated as waters flow south the montana piece the elk river carries selenium pollution right into lake kukanusa a 90 mile reservoir of water that straddles the border between montana and bc with just barely half its length in montana the kootenay river flows out from kukanusa through libby and into idaho both the elk and kootenay rivers are culturally and ecologically significant especially to tanaha nation confederated salish and kootenay tribes and the kootenay tribe of idaho who have always advocated for protecting and restoring these waters in fact in 2020 the montana department of environmental quality deq published water quality standards for how much selenium the state would allow in lake kukanusa and the kootenay river the u s environmental protection agency epa has established a national selenium standard of one point five micrograms per liter in the u s but it also recognizes that the one size fits all standard would not work for all places and developed a process in which states could establish site specific standards that would be protective of beneficial uses of water the epa is also ultimately responsible for approving state standards for selenium over the course of several years dec worked in accordance with the epa's national criteria alongside a group of stakeholders comprised of the bc ministry of environment and climate change strategy u.s fish and wildlife service u.s geological survey university of saskatchewan u.s tribes bc first nations 
and an environmental consultant for Tech Coal to develop a site-specific selenium standard of 0.8 micrograms per liter for Lake Cucanusa in Montana. The BC province was present at most meetings, but did not sign on for the final site-specific standard. Ultimately, the Montana Board of Environmental Review, BER, adopted the 0.8 micrograms per liter standard in the waning days of the Bullock administration, and EPA approved the standard. Because members of the BER are appointed by the governor, a majority of its current members were appointed by newly minted Governor Greg Gianforte in 2021. In a surprising turn of events, Tech Cole successfully lobbied the new BER to attempt to rescind its selenium role and to send a letter to EPA claiming that Montana's new standard was adopted illegally and should be voided. BER is a quasi-judicial agency with a stated mission to protect the health, safety, and interests of our state and our people. Curiously, BER is administratively attached to DEQ, yet DEQ objected repeatedly to BER's attempts to rescind the rule. So where does this leave Montana's standard, and does it apply to tech? For now, EPA considers Montana's 0.8 micrograms per liter for selenium the correct standard. Additionally, MEIC, the Clark Fork Coalition, Idaho Conservation League, and Idaho Rivers United filed a legal challenge against BER in May in Montana's first judicial court in Helena for attempting to unlawfully void Montana's standard. MEIC is represented by Earth Justice in this suit. DEQ has also separately sued its own BER over its attempt to void the standard, and the two cases have been consolidated. As if agency capture and devastating impacts to ecosystems weren't enough, Tech has proposed at least three additional mines on the Elk River in BC. This wouldn't even be legal south of the border under the U.S.'s Clean Water Act, yet it seems perfectly legal in BC. Unfortunately, Montana and Idaho waterways will also suffer the consequences of increased coal mining in the Elk Valley. BC First Nations and U.S. tribes are calling for an International Joint Commission, IJC, reference to help provide a framework for enforcing regulations and working with entities on both sides of the border. The IJC is a binational organization established by the U.S. and Canada under the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. The IJC's Rob Sisson spoke at Montana's Water Policy Interim Committee in October, recommending to Montana legislators that an IJC reference would be beneficial for helping all parties feel heard and move forward with common solutions. For MEIC's part, we will continue to hold the line and push for enforcement of the site-specific selenium standard in Lake Cucanusa, as well as supporting the tribes and other organizations working to prevent more pollution and damaging coal mining through an IJC reference and otherwise. HB 576 and SB 392 the next chapter in the story of the coal industry's undue influence on Montana government. Written by Durf Johnson, read by Katie Spence. For anyone that paid attention to MEIC's lobbying efforts during the 2023 Montana legislature, you will recall two bad coal mining bills that weaved through the process and ultimately became law. These bills were championed by the coal industry as a way to eliminate legal challenges by citizens and nonprofits to coal mining operations, SB 392, sponsored by Senator Steve Fitzpatrick, the Loser Pays Bill, and to reduce water quality protections so that companies could pollute more without repercussions, HB 576, sponsored by Representative Rhonda Knudsen, the Material Damage Bill. Because both of these bills made changes to Montana's coal mining laws, the U.S. Office of Surface Mining, OSM, must approve them before they go into effect. This requirement is part of our cooperative federalism agreement and ability for Montana to continue running the program. However, the Montana legislature, always eager to poke the feds in the eye, put an immediate effective date on the bills with the intent of having the new bills be applicable immediately, rather than after OSM approval. Because this was illegal, MEIC took the Montana Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ, to court to prevent their immediate implementation. Thankfully, because the law on this subject is crystal clear, MEIC quickly reached a stipulated agreement with DEQ in which the agency agreed to not, quote, take any action to apply, effectuate, or enforce the provisions of HB 576 or SB 392, end quote, for seven months. Listen to the September 2023 issue of Down to Earth for more information. 
While this stipulated agreement hit a pause button on DEQ enforcement of the laws, the final resolution of the case and the fate of the two laws still remains. Notably, after the stipulation was entered with the court, Montana Attorney General Austin Knudsen and Westmoreland Rosebud Mining filed motions to intervene in the case. Interestingly, the Office of the Attorney General appears to be unhappy with the legal defense lodged by DEQ, whereby it agreed not to enforce the two laws until federal OSM approval occurs. Westmoreland Rosebud Mining, on the other hand, was primarily concerned with the ability to seek attorney's fees from organizations and individuals so that it could discourage legal challenges and continue mining coal uninterrupted. MEIC also reached a proposed settlement with DEQ through a consent decree that basically mirrors the stipulated agreement and would prohibit the DEQ from enforcing the laws. On November 1st, the judge put a stay on the case through the end of the year, delaying the potential for consent decree to be finalized. Because of the stipulation that MEIC and DEQ reached, the laws will not go into effect until January 19th, or hopefully never. Additionally, as required under the Surface Mine Control and Reclamation Act, or SMACRA, the DEQ requested that OSM conduct a review and approve the two changes to the law. Lucky for us, and for our water, SMACRA was designed to protect the environment from coal mining and encourage citizen participation and accountability. OSM's review process is now fully underway, and if popular sentiments carry the day, as exhibited by the public comments at a hearing on November 1st in Billings, OSM would be hard-pressed to approve these two laws. Of the 50 people who showed up, about 20 commented, including Ann Hedges with MEIC. All but one person, the legislator who sponsored one of the bills, spoke in opposition. Tribal members, ranchers, lawyers, and average Montanans strongly urged the OSM to reject both of the changes. Notably, concerns over water quality, public participation, and climate change were repeatedly brought up as reasons for OSM to reject the changes. Perhaps the most compelling were the written comments from the Northern Cheyenne Tribe urging OSM to protect water quality and reject both bills. Now that the public comment period and public hearing are wrapped up, OSM will make a final decision on approval or denial of SB 392 and HB 576. We expect OSM to reject all or most of these laws, as they do not comply with the intent, letter, or spirit of SMACRA. Of course, any decision that OSM makes will be subject to legal review, and so this sordid tale of undue influence by the coal industry is likely far from over. Signal Peak Mind Causes Surface Damage, Safety Hazards Written by Ann Hedges, read by Katie Spence MEIC joined a dozen other conservation organizations in filing a complaint with state and federal agencies against Signal Peak Energy, operator of the Bull Mountains coal mine north of Billings. The complaint shows evidence of the mine causing subsidence cracks that have damaged lands in and adjacent to Signal Peak's mine. Signal Peak is failing to comply with permit requirements to reclaim lands affected by the subsidence. The subsidence is making it extremely difficult and dangerous for wildlife, wildland firefighters, landowners, and ranchers. Despite knowing about the severe subsidence problems, Montana Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, has failed to protect the public and environment by issuing notices of violation or cessation orders. We requested the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement perform a federal inspection of this mine and issue a cessation order to Signal Peak requiring it halt operations at the Bull Mountains Mine until it complies with the law. While a federal court invalidated Signal Peak's federal mining plan in February 2023, the company is still obligated to repair the damage caused by its coal mine operations. This year, the New York Times reported on the corruption and criminal history surrounding Signal Peak Energy. Along with impacts to local ranchers, the story reveals embezzlement, a fake kidnapping, bribery, cocaine trafficking, firearms violations, past links to Vladimir Putin, and worker safety and environmental violations by the mine and its owners. The Western Environmental Law Center and Earth Justice filed the complaint on behalf of MEIC, Citizens for Clean Energy, 350 Montana, Families for Livable Climate, Moms Clean Air Force, Montana Conservation Voters, Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, Northern Plains Resource Council, Park County Environmental Council, Sierra Club, and Wild Earth Guardians. Montana's Energy Transition 
Written by Nick Fitzmorris. Read by Katie Spence. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. Driven by unprecedented atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, as a result of human activities since the Industrial Revolution. Access to abundant fossil fuel energy has made modern technological development possible, but there are dire consequences to this energy consumption. Addressing the climate crisis does not mean shutting off the power, but it does mean a complete overhaul of the energy systems that modern societies and institutions are built upon. As a net energy exporter, positioned with disproportionate access to untapped fossil fuel reserves, Montana is key in the fight against climate change. This is not just about deploying clean energy infrastructure. This is about a transformation of the entire energy system. Decarbonizing Montana's energy systems is no doubt a transition of great proportion, but it can and must be done to avert the greatest impacts of the climate crisis. Engineers and regulators must abandon antiquated practices. Facing the possibility of this new energy age with open minds, Montanans can lead the charge. Of Montana's energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, nearly 45% come from electric power generation, followed by nearly 30% from transportation, over 15% from industrial processes, and the remaining 10% from commercial and residential heating and cooking. Nationally, about 75% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, etc., result from combusting fossil fuels for energy, including over 90% of the U.S.'s total carbon dioxide emissions. All sources of greenhouse gas emissions must be curtailed, but, as the largest contributor, energy presents the greatest opportunity to lessen anthropogenic emissions. Decarbonizing Montana's energy system will require a highly coordinated effort and the concurrent achievement of several interrelated transformations. To meet energy demand cleanly, Energy electrification, demand side management, and electricity decarbonization are all necessary. Expanding transmission infrastructure and implementing power sharing across the West will also be essential to reliably connect clean energy production to consumers. The Federal Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act have opened substantial federal funding avenues for Montana to facilitate these transformations. Accelerating this energy transition is the directive of my position as MEIC's energy transition engineer. This is a big topic, so I will be unpacking the Montana energy transition in installments, starting with energy electrification. Electricity can be sourced through both carbon-intense and carbon-free means, but carbon-based liquid and gas fuels such as methane and petroleum inherently release carbon dioxide upon combustion. Viable options for generating clean energy exist today so all energy uses must be electrified to rapidly decarbonize the Montana energy system. Electrification targets three general areas, residential and commercial heating, industry, and transportation. Residential and commercial heating. Gas is often used in commercial and residential buildings for space heating, water heating, and cooking. Heat pumps are an extremely efficient alternative that can electrify both space and water heating needs while electric induction stoves are an excellent solution to most efficiently replace gas in cooking applications. Heat pump technology can be employed to recycle thermal energy between neighboring buildings, called clean energy districts, by using the ground and other available sinks as thermal batteries. Montana State University, MSU, has pioneered this technology in the state, deploying several energy districts that connect campus regions with ground source heat pumps. MSU faculty have also been involved in retraining oil and gas drilling operators across the state to drill boreholes for ground source heat pumps. Industry Across the U.S., industries such as cement production and steel manufacturing burn fossil fuels on-site to achieve extremely high temperatures for their processes. Alongside power generation and petroleum refineries, Cement production and associated processes are among the largest point sources of greenhouse gas pollution in Montana. Industrial cement production and lime manufacturing at three sites across the state are collectively responsible for nearly 1 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions annually. That's 2% of total state emissions. Aluminum production is another industry using direct fossil fuel heat, but Montana's only aluminum smelter closed in 2009. Electrifying these industries is a challenge, 
but Antora Energy is developing solid carbon batteries that can be charged with clean electricity for just these industrial heating applications. Chemical processes in industrial manufacturing, such as cement clinker calcination, emit greenhouse gases not associated with energy use. These must be addressed separately. Transportation. Electrifying transportation is a hot topic these days as car manufacturers roll out growing electric vehicle fleets. This electrification eliminates the need for petroleum-based fuels used in combustion engines. Phasing out the combustion engine does not stop at the single occupancy vehicle. Additional progress can be realized toward addressing the climate crisis through expanded access to public transportation, such as electric buses and electric passenger rail. The Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority was recently established to advocate for the revival of abandoned rail service in the state, particularly across southern Montana. Federal funding is explicitly set aside in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to improve passenger rail in the U.S. Freight and cargo shipping vehicles must also be electrified. DEQ Climate Emissions and Resilience Planning Written by Nick Fitzmorris Read by Katie Spence In October, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, or CPRG, awarded the Montana Department of Environmental Quality $3 million as the governor's designated lead agency to develop a climate action plan for the state. This planning grant represents the first of two CPRG funding phases. The second phase will distribute $4.6 billion nationally for implementation projects included in state's climate action plans. DEQ held a public meeting in October to elicit input on pollution reduction measures to include in Montana's plan. The CPRG seeks to target greenhouse gas emissions reductions across the following key economic sectors, electricity generation, industry, transportation, buildings, agricultural, natural, and working lands, and waste management. The governor's office is limiting DEQ to use the funding for, quote, non-regulatory projects. Unfortunately, this makes it very challenging for funds awarded in Montana to target the primary culprit of greenhouse gas emissions, fossil fuel combustion for energy. This is not Montana's first climate planning process, but it is slightly different than previous ones. The Schweitzer administration published the Montana Climate Change Action Plan in 2007, and the Bullock administration published the Montana Climate Solutions Plan in 2020. These planning processes were resource-intensive and amounted to little progress towards concrete greenhouse gas emission reductions. The current process is only intended to provide a framework by which local, state, and tribal governments can apply for additional funding if those projects are included in states' plans. In accepting these federal dollars, DEQ must ensure that the money goes toward a plan that will tangibly move the needle on reducing greenhouse gas emissions with explicit, time-bound goals for Montana's energy system. Unfortunately, the time frame to design projects and apply for funding is tremendously short, and the fossil fuel industry appears to be lining up to receive this funding for performative projects that may very well avoid the transitions necessary for true decarbonization. The Linchpin to Decarbonization in the West Written by Ann Hedges Read by Katie Spence With rising electricity rates and more erratic weather coming as a result of the climate crisis, it's time to look for new solutions. One such solution is an emerging and rarely mentioned arena that holds tremendous potential for not only preventing rate increases and increasing energy reliability, but decarbonizing the entire West. The energy system in the West consists of dozens of individual areas in which a single utility manages the transmission system, If that utility is a publicly traded monopoly, such as Northwestern Energy, it is incentivized to decrease competition and build extremely expensive projects in order to increase revenue for shareholders. Ultimately, that utility wants to sell its product, electricity, for as much as regulators will allow. This has led to a woefully outdated and inefficient energy system in the West. No single entity oversees the grid system to ensure it evolves to meet modern electricity needs and keep prices reasonable for customers. Even though affordable and reliable electricity is critical to our everyday lives and economy, we have let the system languish. But change is on the horizon, and it comes in the form of a modern and interconnected transmission system. 
other areas of the country already engage in energy trading systems within a larger geographic area than is covered by a single entity. These systems, often referred to as independent system operators or regional transmission organization, RTOs, exist in much of the rest of the country to varying degrees of effectiveness, largely depending on the governance structure. There is a strong push to create such an entity in the western U.S. to allow utilities to take advantage of the tremendous geographic and weather diversity and make best use of the energy resources that are available at any point in time. A market has formed in the West that is already extremely successful, the Western Energy Imbalance Market, EIM, which allows participating utilities to trade energy with other utilities on a short-term basis to meet spikes in demand or sell power elsewhere. Since 2014, the EIM has grown to include 22 participants, including Northwestern Energy, who have collectively realized over $4.6 billion in benefits in less than a decade. Northwestern Energy joined the EIM in June 2021 and has already seen benefits of more than $66 million by September 2023. Much like trading food, cars, and even health care across state lines, trading power across a greater geographic landscape just makes sense. While the wind doesn't always blow in the same location, it's almost guaranteed to be blowing somewhere else in the region. The wind profiles of nearby states are very different from Montana. For example, the wind in Montana is most productive in winter months, when coastal states have the highest demand for power. But the wind in Washington and Oregon is strongest during summer months, when other states have a higher demand for power. Sharing electricity resources across a greater area allows electricity to be used in a more efficient and affordable manner for all ratepayers. For example, on September 6, 2022, California faced an intense heat wave and record electricity demand. If customers hadn't immediately responded to a request to decrease demand, the state may have experienced blackouts. On that day, Montana was not experiencing the same heat wave, opening the possibility that we could have provided power if there had been an effective energy market available. But trading on a short-term basis is only the start. Many across the region are working furiously to improve the electricity trading system by creating a system where utilities can trade power the day before they need it. The extended day-ahead market, EDAM, would be the logical next step to creating a more affordable and efficient electricity system. It would ideally be followed up with an RTO, designed and overseen by states to create the greatest benefit for electricity reliability and customers' bills. Trading power across state lines already happens, but it is an inefficient and bilateral system. An organization that oversees the electric grid helps expedite upgrades to an aging and inadequate transmission system and helps ensure power is used more efficiently and affordably makes sense. And while an RTO is still a few years away, EDAM is likely to be up and running in the next year or so. The ability of these two market structures to help utilities meet peak demand without building new power plants cannot be overstated. These market structures need to be a priority in our climate work. Clean energy generation is an important part of decarbonizing, but hooking up to a regional grid can reduce the energy generated and wasted across the entire West. The cleanest and cheapest energy is that which is not used, so a more efficient method of managing electricity demand could address emissions and air pollution on a truly impactful scale. Montana Department of Transportation's Carbon Reduction Plan Falls Flat Written by Nick Fitzmorris, read by Katie Spence In September, the Montana Department of Transportation, MDT, released its draft carbon reduction strategy for a public review period. Developing a carbon reduction strategy in each state is a requirement under the Carbon Reduction Program within the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in order to access funding for projects that will reduce carbon emissions from transportation sources. While the draft carbon reduction strategy establishes that the current transportation emissions baseline in Montana is 8 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, mostly from direct tailpipe emissions, the MDT did not use the strategy as an opportunity to commit to specific emissions reduction goals. MDT split its projects into the following strategy buckets, transportation demand management, mode choice, vehicles, parking, transportation system management and operations, energy, and construction and maintenance. 
While numerous valuable strategy areas and projects are superficially explored within these themes, little detail is provided on the potential projects. MDT makes no explicit commitments to pursue any of these projects, and there's no analysis of their emissions reduction potential. In the public review period, MEIC advocated for a number of improvements. These included focusing more on the electricity generation and associated emissions powering Montana's growing electric vehicle fleets, expanding passenger rail access in Montana, particularly along the I-90 corridor in partnership with the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority, and containing suburban sprawl, moving away from car-centric development and bolstering transit connectivity for more walkable and bikeable cities. MEIC particularly emphasized that MDT must develop an explicit plan and emission reduction targets to not let available funds go to waste. Having collected public input, including from MEIC and our members, MDT finalized the strategy document in November. The projects outlined will direct the allocation of an estimated $68.1 million in funding apportioned to Montana over the next five years. Climate Implications of Land Use Planning Written by Anne Schwend Read by Katie Spence The Earth is warming. Humans, and our lifestyle choices, large living quarters, electricity consumption, and personal vehicles, are responsible for emitting much of the carbon pollution that is driving that change. Making better individual choices can be part of a climate solution, but how development occurs is an important part of the puzzle. Poor planning can significantly increase carbon emissions, and thoughtful planning can help cities grow with fewer harmful impacts to our climate. While MEIC will continue working toward high-level, high-impact climate solutions, local solutions can also add up, especially when it comes to development patterns and local household carbon footprints. Increased carbon footprints are accelerating climate change, so how we develop our communities really matters. According to the Brookings Institute, U.S. urban land area grew 1.7 times faster than population growth between 1960 and 2010. This data indicates that a much larger percentage of people are living in locations that require more driving, increasing Americans' daily travel mileage by 85%. We have created and encouraged a shift from walkable city living to a suburban car culture. Studies have consistently shown a lower household carbon footprint in urban areas as compared to outlying suburbs. In Montana, due to limited public transportation and longer commute times, Car culture is a driving factor in higher carbon footprints, with vehicle exhaust accounting for the largest percentage of carbon emissions. Moving further away from city centers, the household carbon footprint tends to increase because homes are often larger, single-family units, and the residents drive more. Even if a rural resident drives an electric car, runs energy-efficient appliances, and has a solar-powered home, a 20-mile commute likely contributes more carbon than a resident in a duplex or an apartment in town. Quite simply, in order to address the climate crisis, we must change our unsustainable land use practices by building human-centered neighborhoods that minimize car culture and consume less energy. Development patterns also impact the local hydrology. Increased temperatures mean that snowpack is melting earlier each spring. If the majority of the annual water budget falls as snowpack and then comes out in a spring flash, it is vital to capture that water when it is available. Allowing a river to spill over its banks and saturate the floodplain can function much like a sponge to slow down high spring flows, percolate into the shallow aquifer, and slowly release critical late summer return flows to the rivers and streams. If structures, homes, and roads restrict the floodplain, much of the annual available water flows by, and the opportunity to store snowmelt is lost until next season. Traditionally, communities have built levees to protect themselves from floodwaters but channelizing the river may actually increase downstream flooding. Confining a flooding river increases pressure and velocity, much like a fire hose, so that once past the levees, the downstream communities are greatly impacted. While it probably isn't feasible to move entire cities out of the floodplain, it is possible to better incorporate water resource planning with land use planning and minimize future building in locations that aren't suitable. Flooding doesn't have to be a natural disaster, but could be an opportunity to bank water and recharge aquifers. Current floodplain management is all about reducing the risk for man-made structures. We should rethink this approach and instead identify and minimize development in areas where flooding is reasonable to recharge the system and reduce downstream flooding. It's important to consider the causes and effects of a changing climate. 
Changing precipitation patterns impact future water supplies, and, as Montana warms, summers become longer and drier, dramatically changing water use and availability. Each of these factors creates a bad feedback loop for maintaining sustainable communities. It is important to consider historic development patterns, learn from mistakes, and plan for a hotter future with a limited water supply. We simply cannot reach emission reduction targets unless we reconsider our growth and development patterns. Addressing the drivers of climate warming is paramount, such as reducing vehicle emissions by encouraging more development in walkable urban areas and climate-conscious lifestyle choices. We also need to locate development more appropriately and adapt to changing hydrologic regimes. These changes can start in our individual homes and how we plan, locate, and build our communities. Exempt Wells, Montana's White Elephant Gift, written by Anne Schwend, read by Katie Spence. We all need water to survive, and it's certainly much more convenient if it is piped directly into our homes rather than hauling it one bucket at a time. But just how clean and secure are those supplies? The answer may depend on whether that water is coming from an individual domestic well or from a public or municipal system. In Montana, most of the new subdivisions that are being built outside of city limits and out of range for public water utilities rely on individual domestic wells for water supplies. This is occurring for a variety of reasons, but mainly because putting in a public system is a big investment and requires a permitted water right. Obtaining a water right is costly, time-consuming, and can be very difficult. Many of our fastest-growing communities are located in basins that are administratively or legislatively closed to any new surface water rights because there are more water rights than water that is actually physically available. This is known as overappropriation. Because a public water system requires a legal water right, it makes it extremely challenging for housing developers, especially in a closed basin. This leaves few choices and drives developments to depend on exempt wells in order to provide water for new homes. What was meant to be a minor exception to the water right system is now the default method used to bypass it altogether. So what exactly is an exempt well? The definition has gone through many legal and statutory changes, but suffice to say it is a domestic or stock water well that is exempt from the traditional water right permitting process. These small wells pump water at less than 35 gallons per minute to a maximum of 10 acre feet per year in total volume. Basically, the landowner drills a well, files an application, and the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, DNRC, will issue a certificate of completion for that well. The simplified process is not the same as the full permitting process to get a traditional water right permit. The full permitting process requires an in-depth analysis of legal and physical availability and cumulative impacts and sufficient notification to potentially affected water right holders. The original intent of the exempt well provision was to provide water for rural home sites or livestock. Unfortunately, this exemption is now creating a problematic loophole as more and more developments rely on this system for their water. Building entire subdivisions and ignoring the cumulative impacts of hundreds or thousands of wells is creating an unmitigated, unmonitored train wreck. While domestic or household water use is not consumptive, the water returns to the system via a septic drain field, most households have some outdoor landscaping and lawns, which is very consumptive. Additionally, as communities grow and multiple subdivisions locate in close proximity, there is an increased risk of drawing down the aquifer, especially during hot summer months. Recall that when DNRC reviews a proposed subdivision, it does not analyze the cumulative water resource impacts or physical availability of multiple individual wells outside of the proposed project area. Since exempt wells do not require the full water permitting analysis, DNRC only reviews each proposed project independently, without consideration of how the new wells will impact existing water rights and surrounding wells. Another issue with exempt wells is that homeowners often don't realize the potential vulnerability of their water quantity or quality. Long-term monitoring and maintenance of individual wells are the responsibility of the private property owner. The homeowner has the well drilled, maintains the pump, protects the wellhead, and should check annually for contamination in the well. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, more than 43 million Americans rely on private wells, and federal experts estimate that more than a fifth of private wells have contaminant levels that are considered unsafe. 
it is especially important to monitor wells in areas with high concentrations of older individual septic systems which may not be designed or maintained to filter out bacteria nitrates pharmaceuticals minerals or forever chemicals pfas additionally if aquifer levels change due to drought new developments or changing land use practices on neighboring properties then it is the homeowner's responsibility to drill a deeper well there are no guarantees that groundwater will continue to remain at current levels especially as we continue to put more unmonitored straws into the system and change land use and irrigation practices all without consideration of the interconnectedness to the diminishing aquifer on the other hand Homes located on municipal or public utility systems have a larger degree of certainty that water will be supplied to their homes. The responsibility for securing and effectively delivering water lies with the public works department and not the homeowner. The water is also treated and tested regularly for pollution or pathogens. Homeowners pay for the amount of water that is consumed through monthly bills, but they don't have to stay up at night worrying about pumps going out, declining aquifer levels, or unsafe drinking water. While it may be easier or less costly for the developer to build without providing a water supply system, it is not necessarily less expensive to the homeowner. We cannot continue to behave as if water is an unlimited resource or that exempt wells don't impact existing water users or everyone's right to clean water. Changing land use in a rapidly changing climate will only increase the supply and demand imbalance, and we need a system that accounts for all water use, protects water rights holders, and provides homeowners with defensible water right. It is time to reconsider how to adequately provide water for new developments through a new permitting system that considers cumulative impacts and plans for future growth. Too many straws in and out of the same system is already causing a noticeable difference in overall water levels and quality. Something needs to change. Farewell, Melissa. After working with MEIC for two and a half years, Melissa Newts is leaving. We'll miss her thoughtful questions, her sharp wit, and her unyielding advocacy for the people who live in Montana. Thanks for working with us, Melissa. We'll miss you. Extraordinary Hope, a conversation with Roger Sullivan. Written and read by Katie Spence. MEIC is fortunate to have a number of friends and allies that we can call upon for support, encouragement, or assistance. This year, we feel especially fortunate to know our board member, mentor, and friend Roger Sullivan. Roger has a deep history in Montana environmental law and justice. For more than 35 years, Roger has advocated for Montanans and our constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. He has successfully represented dozens of Libby residents sickened by exposure to asbestos from the W.R. Grace mining operations. Most recently, Roger was one of the attorneys in the landmark youth climate trial held v. State of Montana. Roger served on MEIC's board multiple times and has represented MEIC and other public health and environmental groups in innumerable cases. He tirelessly advises and mentors young environmental lawyers in the state including many of whom who have worked with, or still work with, MEIC. Here's a conversation I had with Roger as he was driving to Missoula to speak with environmental law students about HELD and MEIC. This conversation has been edited for brevity and clarity. Click the link in the show notes to read along. Katie, what does justice mean to you, Roger? Roger, we know of justice as fairness. All of our citizens should have an equal and fair voice in forums, whether that's legislative, administrative, or judicial. That's really hard to do for marginalized citizens and communities. We should also make sure that we don't limit our concept of justice to simply the present and the past. What I've really tried to interject into the decision-making process in the courts and in the legislature is the concept of intergenerational justice. The decisions we are making now will have a profound impact on future generations. Science is demonstrating that this generation is consuming the quality of life for future generations, and I consider that to be an injustice that we in the present time must address. That was one of the major themes of the recent Held v. Montana trial. One of the real important parts of my practice is making myself available for the next generation of lawyers, and it's been a great joy. Katie, speaking of young lawyers, how did you get into environmental law? Roger. When I was a young person, there were a lot of environmental-related decisions that were being made. I started attending various public meetings and basically just doing an on-the-spot file review like, 
hand me that environmental assessment and attempting to express some concerns. That was how I got started. And people would say, wow, have you ever thought of being a lawyer? At the time, I was a carpenter and a back to the lander. And it was nice to have that encouragement. I traveled down to the University of Montana Law School and got to be friends with one of the fabulous cornerstones of Montana Natural Resource, Environmental, and Indian Law, Marge Brown. We just got along so well, and Marge made every effort she could to help me figure out the logistics. It's really important to have a community of support for doing these kinds of things. Katie, looking ahead, what do you see as the key moments or challenges facing Montana in the next few years? Roger, it's going to be really important to communicate to all Montanans across this beautiful landscape the importance of our state constitution. So much of the work that we've been doing in recent years has hinged on our ability to identify those constitutional rights that the founders created way back in 1972, but have taken really about half a century in order to breathe life into. Specifically, the right to a clean and healthful environment for this and future generations, but also the full range of rights that are important companions of that right. We've got to make sure that we're doing our part to defend against attacks on that extraordinary and visionary document. The other challenge is to continue this process of transition. Increasingly, Montanans are becoming aware through their own experiences, their own observations on their farms and ranches, their own observations on their ski areas and in their recreational pursuits, that climate change is upon us. With that awareness, then the challenge becomes, how do we move away from the fossil fuel economy that supports so many Montanans? and move into this transition process that will equally, or, as Professor Jacobson pointed out in his testimony at the HELD trial, even better support average Montanans, both financially as well as environmentally. There's also a whole lot of families that rely on the extractive economy for a decent livelihood, and that's really important to keep in mind. Katie, what advice do you have to people who are looking to make a difference on these or other issues? Roger, one of the keys is collaboration. There's really not an environmental issue that we're involved in, that we're not collaborating with everyone. From the local community to concerned activists conceptualizing it into the larger policy scheme of things and working with existing groups to really find an effective coalition of advocates, whether it's with the Western Environmental Law Center or Earth Justice, it's important to develop those relationships and coalitions because one, it makes us much more effective. Two, it's nice to have that kind of support and three, it's a whole lot more fun. We all bring different talents to this important project of making the world a better place for future generations. Katie, how do you stay hopeful in the face of the climate crisis? Do you? Roger. Oh, I'm absolutely hopeful. The way I stay hopeful is by doing what I can to participate in the large project of addressing the challenges of our time and recognizing that what I contribute is just part of a much larger project and process that takes us all contributing our unique gifts. Remarkably, as our experts testified in the recent HELD trial, there's still time to turn this climate crisis around. We can do this, and I believe we must. And we might as well have a good time while we're at it, right? It doesn't mean we don't try as hard as we possibly can, but it kind of lightens the load. And I do think the world will ultimately be a better place for it. And it's not just because of us, but because of that larger movement of which we're a part. Roger shared a psalm in the course of our conversation. Blessed be the spider that sways between the trees on a single filament of hope, confident of the wind. He said, if you've ever watched how a spider makes a web, it just drops down that one little filament and waits for the wind to blow, and then it can begin the process of making that extraordinary web. I just consider myself part of that larger web. We're part of this much larger process, and we are doing what we can. Reflecting with Pride, Anticipating with Hope Written by Carrie Kimball Read by Katie Spence The light is low and the air is crisp. I know I'm not alone in the annual struggle of striking the right balance between making merry and hibernating during this time of year. The hustle and bustle of holiday season gatherings and activities can be so cheerful and fun but the introvert in me particularly enjoys hunkering down for a cozy day of reading, many mugs of tea, and baking projects. This time of year also offers us a chance to reflect on all that took place in 2023 and to ponder what we'll be working toward in the year to come. And boy, do we have a lot of accomplishments to reminisce about. 
2023 was quite the year. Things really started with a bang as MEIC's four full-time lobbyists joined forces with our communications and engagement staffers to lobby the heck out of the 2023 legislative session. With the help of our partners and supporters, MEIC's team battled proposals to amend Montana's constitution, proposals to undercut rooftop solar, takings legislation that would hand out Boku bucks to developers at the expense of our local communities, a 300% tax increase on wind energy projects, a loser pay bill that would mean only the richest of the rich could level legal challenges, and so much more. Despite stiff headwinds, MEIC successfully lobbied for the passage of two right-to-know laws that will increase transparency in government decision-making. All in all, the legislature presented us with crucial opportunities to connect with our supporters who joined us for 18 Zoom legislated info updates with an average of 53 attendees each week, six legislative roadshow gatherings in communities across the state, and three in-person rallies and lobby days at the Capitol. After a long, intense legislative session, MEIC staff took a deep breath, dusted ourselves off, and dove back into the work. After all, there's little use to lobbying for good environmental legislation if we aren't also ensuring those laws are followed. In 2023, we saw several good decisions out of the courts. Rulings that an expansion at the Rosebud coal mine was illegal, that the permitting process for Big Sky Subdivision's wastewater system was inadequate, an expansion of the Signal Peak coal mine was illegal, and that DEQ failed to fully weigh the impacts of climate when approving permits for Northwestern Energy's polluting gas plant in Yellowstone County. As always, one of our favorite activities is connecting with our members, supporters, and partners to make moves for Montana's air, water, land, critters, and climate. Over the summer, our crew convened a Summer Montana Climate Summit for advocates across the state to identify ways to further weave our work together. We rallied our friends to show love for the held we State of Montana Youth Plaintiffs where MEIC's work played a pivotal role in the court's favorable decision, supported a successful inaugural Billings Climate Week, and bolstered energetic turnout for PSC and DEQ hearings where folks voiced concerns about the climate and the injustice of Northwestern energy rate hikes. And, of course, in September, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of MEIC's founding by gathering with our community of supporters in the Bitterroot to eat delicious food, hear from inspiring speakers, and dance the night away under a big star-filled sky. That was the party of a lifetime. Thank you, thank you, to everyone who attended the event, to our staff for their work in pulling it off, and to our generous sponsors. What a team. I love seeing the through line of how MEIC's work this year builds upon our organization's 50 years of history. Banning heap leach mining, protecting Montana's beloved Blackfoot and Smith Rivers, to stopping coal plant construction, fighting for government transparency, advocating for the public's right to participate, holding corporations accountable, defending grizzly bear habitat and wilderness waters, and keeping toxic, carcinogenic pollutants out of our air, water, and soil. MEIC is nimble, effective, and persistent. We are able to do so much because we have a fantastic community of rabble-rousers and changemakers, brilliant partners with complementary strengths, and a staff and board team that consistently show up. Montana is exceptional. We draw inspiration from the most beautiful place on the planet. And because we treasure so much about this place, we also know we have a lot to lose. Unfortunately, extractive industries have also set their sights on our state. In the coming year, we will continue to demand better for Montana and Montanans. We deserve cleaner air, water, and energy, and thoughtfully developed communities that will provide a higher quality of life for future generations. With your help, we'll be moving closer and closer to that brighter future. I hope that this winter, you'll find yourself sipping a warm beverage and gazing at some snow-capped peaks to really savor this season of reflection and gratitude. Please know that from our corner of the last best place, we'll be toasting you. Your role in MEIC's circle of supporters has helped make it all possible. Cheers to 50 more years. Please check the show notes for more information on how you can take action on the topics in this issue. If you enjoyed this issue and find value in our work, please consider becoming an MEIC member by donating today. Thanks for listening.